tables and chairs out there so you can come sit. And who knows, maybe you'll see someone, maybe you'll meet someone. But if you'd like to do that, we have a sukkah for you. If you want to spend the night, I'm not sure what the rules are in Park Hill, but go for it. <laughs> um, following Sukkot, our Simchat Torah Rock celebration, Sunday morning, we're doing a little different. It's not an evening, but a morning. Sunday morning here. If you've never seen us unroll the Torah scroll, it's pretty cool. So that's part of our Simchat Torah uh, celebration. So come join us. If you have seen us, then you know we need help holding the scroll, so please come. Um, but uh, it's a fun way to kind of end the year. So, that's an easy. So, when you're in this moment like mine and we have people here, we want to tell you, us rabbis, everything that's going on. That's kind of what we do. So, you may have heard the news, and if not, I'm not sure why I'm breaking to you now, but I'm breaking to you. Temple Mike is moving. Our lease with Park Hill Congregational Church ends on December 31st, and beginning January 1st, we will be housed at Montview Boulevard Presbyterian Church, just down the road. And if you haven't heard, there's plenty of us who want to talk to you about it and tell what's up, why we do this. I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts and any gritty and which room we'll have and things like that. But I want to say that here, well, first of all, because in the weird politics of synagogues and churches, it was just last, this past Tuesday, that Montview's session, what they call their board, formally approved it. Because of who we could tell, when we could tell, but it's, it's real. It's official now. Phew, it's happening. Even though we were confident that was going to happen, if you ever sat in a board meeting, you know, until the meeting's over and the things are done, it's not done. We do this, this meaning share space with the church, intentionally and purposely. It may not have started out that way. Back, back in the day in the 70s when Temple Micah couldn't afford to maintain its building that was at the corner of Cedar and Monaco and needed a space, and Judy and Al Goldberg had some connection with the, the pastor at Park Hill Congregational Church and said, hey, why don't you come on over here? But what's evolved over the time is intention, is purpose. We share space because that's the way we think we can exist most efficiently, most purposely, most authentically in the world as community. We obviously would never share a space where someone couldn't fit us physically, and that wouldn't work. But that's... That's the, only the first step. For us, sharing space is about being environmentally following our values and efficiently using space in a world that we know using less carbon, less electricity is better for the world. We live in a space where we would need to live in a space where a community aligns ideologically with our values. We need to share space with a community that we would need to See the world the same way. Envision the world that we want. We need to live in a space and share space because we believe as much as we love our Judaism and its particularity and specific customs and practices, we are universalists. That we aspire for human well-being. And to model two different faiths Sharing under one roof to the world is part of what we value as part of that, too. I love telling that story. I love saying those things. I love saying who we are and how we try to be Micah in the 21st century. But truth be told, if you look out at the United States right now, and for places like us, and I mean just synagogues, I mean liberal, progressive communities of worship, of religiosity, we're in trouble. If you look out into the world and the way people spend their time and their money, their resources, institutions that, who do what we do 
are not growing. Maybe we're sustaining, but most likely not. And it's not just, it's everywhere out there. We all face this challenge of where the world is right now. And you don't have to go far to read whatever you read, watch whatever you watch, what they say about religion in America. You've heard of the nuns, you know, when they survey, what religion are you, what, what are you? And there is a growing, growing number of people who on that survey tick off or answer, I'm nothing, I'm none. Doesn't do so well for people who might be something. And I've seen that too. In my, since my ordination in 1994, this is not statistical or scientific, in my time with you for 20 years, it is different the way that people think about participating, affiliating, supporting. We're in a bit of trouble. We have some challenges in front of us. One of the things I've been reading over the past few months is there's a columnist for the New York Times named Jessica Gross who has done a series of newsletters about this question and giving back surveys and interviewing people about their religiosity, their affiliation, their participation. What I didn't know is that she's Jewish too. And what she wrote in the very first newsletter of the series just, to me, captured what is going on in the moment. What our ethos in our society is feeling or wrestling with. In explaining her purpose and her intentions, this is what she wrote. My own feeling, she's talking about religious affiliation, is one of profound ambivalence. I have no interest in going back to temple and little trust or appetite for organized religion. But I feel passionately about being Jewish and a little heartsick about not knowing quite how to pass along my ritual and my history to my children. I do wonder what may be lost by not having a community connected by belief, but I'm not quite sure what that is or if replacing it is possible or even desirable. <laughs> That's just everything. I don't want this. I do want it. I think I like that, but I'm not sure what that is. What do we do, and the we, I cautiously put you around, but certainly me, we who have our interest, our viability, our vision invested in synagogues do with that and with where we are. <laughs> well, here's the moment where I kind of joked about it when I was done with the announcements that rabbis like us, like me, <laughs> we have all you here. I call it the seduction of the high holy days. Well, you're here, and I've got you captive, and if I just tell you all the great stuff that we're going to do, you're going to come back in droves. Uh, it, doesn't, it, def, it doesn't work that way. Or, I have you here on this day. You've heard me talking about death, life and death, and it's heavy and it's weighty. It's a great opportunity to lay some heavy guilt on you. And that's really seductive too. Because if I could just say the right thing and get you to feel the right thing. I used to work with a rabbi when I was an assistant who loved that moment. In fact, when we would go out, we'd be out together in community and people would see us, the two rabbis together, and they'd say hello. We'd always get to the point where they sheepishly were a little embarrassed because they haven't seen us in a while. And they'd say to us, They'd recognize, oh, I'm going to come, I'm so, I feel so badly. And he'd love that. <laughs> he, well, yes, you know, yes, you should. And he just loved that, and he worked it, and I kind of cringed in the corner in that moment. Because that's, that's not how I roll. Even though the temptation is there, as I said, I, I'm invested in this. Twenty. Seven of my 29 years of being a rabbi have been working in synagogue. 
my family's financial viability depends on synagogue being successful. Ostensibly, I got into this because I care about Judaism, the Jewish people, human beings. And even though we're a human institution with all the foibles of any human institution, I do believe this one has something to offer for people being human, for Jews being Jews. And so I've come to that, I'm not going to give the guilt trip, so you can take a breath. But in my deliberations, I did get to say, well, why don't I just tell them, instead of telling them to come, why don't you say, don't even bother. I mean, if it's really not that much to you and it's nice once a year, then there's a lot of great places in town. Just go do your thing. Because not knowing and being in the middle, that's even harder than that. So just, just don't come. I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> yeah, obviously, <laughs> well, there was a certain appeal to my subversive nature to actually say that. I didn't end up there, obviously. So where did I end up? As we as a community are in transition. As we, Temple Micah, who value what the idea of this community is and try to figure out right at this moment in Jewish history, in American history, what it is that I want from you. Be holy. I mean, wait, wait, wait. That doesn't, that non sequitur, did you miss something? Did the tape skip ahead? No, that's it. And don't worry, I'm going to tell you why that's my message. I've often wondered about why the Torah portions we read today get read. The first one you've heard already. And I mention that part of what I think it's mentioned is because it is this gathering of community. Everybody's there. It is this, no matter your status or status, gen, gender, even in that gender time and patriarchal time, everyone was there. And not only that, one of my favorite lines said, even those who aren't there, you're there. It was the ultimate big tent. So partially... We're here to celebrate community and its power. But then, in this afternoon, and I know many of you will not be here to hear it. Don't worry, because just as the portion said this morning, even though you won't be here, you'll be here. We read the Holiness Code. At the beginning of the Holiness Code, the Holiness Code says, Kiddoshim you, be holy. And it never hit me until I was wrestling and thinking about this subject this morning, is that they're together for a reason. They're together because there's a connection towards finding holiness and being in community. And so I say to you, be holy. Well, maybe you're thinking, wait a minute, holiness... Holiness, it's all kind of separate, pristine. you got to do some official incantations and rituals. and yeah. No. I think holiness is the, the outer protective, the, the first place we touch the divine. I, could, I found someone who actually explained it better than I do. There's a, a Christian theologian named Barbara Taylor Brown who's really thoughtful and wonderful, and she talks about kind of this, about religions and institutions and not fitting and still wanting meaning. I bet she'd have a good conversation with Jessica Gross. But she talks about trying to figure it out and fit in right now. She was on a podcast called On Being with Krista Tippett, great podcast if you've never come across it. But they were talking about this. They were talking about the nuns. Not the Catholic nuns, but the, the nuns from the surveys. And she said, I don't, I don't really like that term. It's just, it's de denigrating. The nuns are still searching. They still want to find that meaning, that connection. They still want 
and she just framed it as holiness. And Krista pushed her on that and said, what do you mean that kind of the reaction that I just had? And Barbara Taylor Brown said, to be holy, holiness is keeping one's balance while the earth moves under our feet. She defined holiness as keeping our balance while the earth moves under our feet. The things that are holy are those things that ground us, that sustain us. That as the world and the moves in the way, in the chaotic, crazy, unknown way it does, holiness are the things that tether us to something bigger and greater. And maybe give us those things you were naming this morning. Strength, loving kindness, understanding. So I say to you this morning... Be holy. When I say that, I'm saying, go find the institutions, the communities that ground you in the moving, chaotic world. If you pay attention to the holiness code, or even Deuteronomy that I read this morning, it just says they're all together. Deuteronomy doesn't say, oh, go join a synagogue. It doesn't say go build a synagogue. It doesn't say go hire a rabbi. The holiness code doesn't speak of any of those things. It just lists these things, how you treat those people that are different than you, that you interact with, the stranger. And throughout the holiness code, I love it just repeats, I am your God. I am your God. I am your God. So part of being holiness is having a sense and awareness of what is sacred and divine to you. So when I say, be holy, kedoshim to you, I'm saying to you, for, for God's sake, take the time and find the communities, create the institutions that make you feel holy, grounded, tethered, secure. And it's not you alone. Because I left something out about the, the holiness code. Kedoshim to you, it does not say kadosh to you, as in the grammar of Hebrew saying just to you individually. Kedoshim is plural. It is a collective charge. It's not that we can't stumble onto holiness alone, but there's something about doing it collectively that we can capture that we can't capture individually. Be holy. Because what is most essential for you and your soul, for your family, for our world, is that we human beings create these institutions that do that for us. That create the institutions that remind us of our values, that put us in touch with the people that help us keep our balance while the earth moves constantly under our feet. Though shame to you, be holy. Part of that is assessing, are there institutions out there that maybe have done some of the work already? Are there institutions out there that are struggling to grow, to evolve, to figure out themselves, but maybe they have a tap into some heritage, some wisdom? and be creating this holiness for a long time. Maybe there are people who have some experience, some insight, some life-acquired wisdom about how to do that themselves. And if there are those out there, even though they've done wrong, even though they've misstepped, even though they may not be exactly in pace with the quick-moving 21st century. Maybe they could use you to help create that holiness. Now, your response may be, no. Those old, tired institutions, I want to start fresh. More power to you. As long as you're holy. 
as long as you respond to the charge, to find and create that in the world, because we need that. We human beings will not survive, will not be more without that. So as you look ahead to all the ways in your year that you want to grow and evolve, please accept this charge for me. Put it on your to-do list. Be holy. Put yourself in, support, create the institutions that help you realize that. If so happens, there may be a little synagogue in Denver, Colorado that you feel maybe does that okay and you want to help do it more, I have a feeling you might be able to do that too. Go out into your lives, into your year. Kidoshim tehiyu. Create, make room for, be holy.